makers and welcome to day two of this very special travel vlog series where I take you to Rhinebeck weekend. Yesterday we went to Indie Untangled and Woolen Folk so if you haven't seen that vlog make sure to check it out and today we're going to Rhinebeck the New York Sheep and Wool Festival. We just arrived. I'm in the parking lot. I'm actually shooting this little intro in the car again because it is still raining. Not as hard yet. Not God would is yesterday, but we're just pretending it's Scotland. <laughs> we're going to embrace the day ahead. I'm so looking forward to the day. It is so magical to be back here already. The drive up here was beautiful. So I hope you've been enjoying some of those views already. But yes, if you are new here, I'm Joanna. This is Stitching the High Notes. I make weekly vlogs where I share what I am currently making, whether it be knitting, sewing, crochet, cross stitch. I also share what I'm making for my small business, where I make project bags for knitters and makers like you. And yeah, and travel vlogs like this one. So this is the second of three in October and November this year. After today, we'll be going to Portland for the Sacred Sheep Festival at the beginning of November. But I am ready to go in. So let's go. The New York Sheep and Wool Festival is an annual gathering of the fiber arts enthusiasts in the United States and worldwide that draws approximately 30,000 visitors and more than 300 vendors every October. It is held at the Dutchess County Fairgrounds in the beautiful village of Rhinebeck, New York. The festival was first held in 1980. It is attended by knitters, crocheters, hand spinners, and growers of natural fiber producing livestock, which includes sheep, goats, angora rabbits, llamas, musk, oxen, and alpacas. And of course, it includes vendors of those materials and the tools associated with each. In addition to the myriad of vendors and demonstrations of fiber arts activities, the festival features several livestock competitions, sheepdog trials, and other contests. We began the day shopping in several of the vendor barns where I was introduced to many new to me businesses and some of my favorites. I made my first purchases of the festival, which I'll be sharing later on in this vlog in a nice long chat and debrief about the week as a whole. The crowds were in full force, but at a manageable level and would have been even more so if it hadn't been raining. We all made do, but I'm not the only one who sorely missed sitting on the various lawns on the grounds, knitting in a circle with friends. Even so, we knitters are determined to knit, and where there's a will, there's a way, and when there were moments when the rain slowed, we found a dry spot and knit together. goal for this day was to meet and connect with as many folks as possible. The annual podcast meetup on The Hill, a large, well, hill in the middle of the fairgrounds began around 1 p.m. and 
thankfully the rain let up just in time this is when the spirit of Rhinebeck really kicked in for me ooing and awing over each other's knits gaining inspiration hugging and crying after many years apart or upon meeting for the first time it was pure magic and I was thrilled and honored to meet so many of you After the big meetup, Denise and I walked around and shopped a bit more. We petted and thanked the sheep for the wool they provide, and we continued shopping and meeting friends new and old. moment of sitting and knitting with our friend Gabby of Plies and Hellhounds and her husband which was much needed after a full day on our feet. I came away from this first day with an overwhelming sense of gratitude and looking forward to another day of yarny goodness and friendship on Sunday. But before we headed out, we went to one more barn, which was the food barn, and also where the competition voting and workshops are housed as well. I had not been to this barn when I went my first time in 2017, and it was a thrill. And I got some more goodies that I will be sharing with you in the hall in our chat at the end of this vlog. So stay tuned. shopping bags and more importantly our hearts very full Denise and I headed to our hotel across the river in Kingston and rested up for the final day of Rhinebeck weekend Good morning from day two of the New York Sheep and Wool Festival. I am here just for a few hours. I was exhausted last night, so I didn't do a roundup and we're gonna be merging the two days together. I'm hoping to see a few more vendors and hopefully some more friends who are coming just for today for Sunday. So I'm ready to get in. There's Denise, she's ready to go. <laughs> Let's go inside. crossed they have bags today that were sold out
After doing a bit of shopping and gaining lots of inspiration from these beautiful pom-pom quarterly samples, I headed over to the Cashmere Goat Association booth to chat with the founders of Clean Cashmere, who I had met on Friday at Indie Untangled. I was honored to be able to interview them and introduce you to just one of the many amazing fiber producing businesses vending at Rhinebeck and many wool festivals like it. Okay, well, I'm Heidi Dickens. This is Christine. And um, we are cashmere goat farmers and realized that other cashmere goat farmers were having a hard time taking their cashmere and making it into a product to sell. And so we started this company to buy cashmere direct from small farms across the U.S. and then we can put that into products that are best suited for the cashmere they're growing. And so we started this about a year ago, incorporated about a year and a half ago, and then Rhinebeck was our first show. It was like trial by fire. <laughs> so that's, we are all about getting the revenue back to the farmer. And that is our goal. And we are trying to make a model, an integrated supply chain model that then anybody can step in and keep doing this for farms and so but we've got to grow both ends we've got to grow more farmers and we've got to grow more cashmere and more you know more knitters and to use u.s cashmere this is amazing and how did you come to cashmere um well everybody kind of comes to cashmere goats their own way but yeah. once you meet them and and especially have them on your farm and compare them to other livestock you can have it's kind of the dog of absolutely the yeah, livestock yeah. world they're just yeah. so smart and yeah. they just are so personable and they they stay together in family groups for generations you'll have the mom and the grandma and the aunt all lay together every night and they'll babysit each other's you know kids yeah. are just yeah. so fun yeah. you know yeah. and there is a sense of um you know just they, they're so loyal they get used to you yes. and um you know, I'm not against sheep. I love sheep, but sheep and goats are very different. And, and goats get a bad rap with the fencing. Everybody thinks know, they're going to yeah. get out and they're going to, you know, be on your car and they're going to. And and that's not if you know if you get the right advice on how to handle goats, it's that's not an issue. Yeah. So and they're really a diversified, great herd animal. They go along well with cows. They go along well, and you know, and they're a safer animal to work with sometimes than the bigger livestock for for certain people too. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a lot of pluses: milk, fiber, meat, um, mm -hmm. and um, so. It, it can add a lot of income, yeah. you know, potentially, not a lot, but at least something as far as diversified for yeah. a lot of farms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And you guys do yarn as well. So tell me a little bit about that branch. Of well, that's, so basically, um, if it weren't for hand spinners and for knitters, probably the cashmere breed would have kind of gone away in the U.S. Um, and so this community is what really kept the in genetic inventory for us to even do something like this because these small cashmere farms were selling to hand spinners and they were making you know small runs of yarn and people were buying it and that just kind of kept this genetic pool in the U.S. for the last 40 years mm -hmm. and so this is where we really felt like we needed to honor that history and always have part of our company that would that would be in service to this crafting community. Yeah. And eventually, you know, if we are able to get the processing equipment back in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and to get the the livestock, the pool of raw fiber, you know, mm -hmm. the goats in the U.S., then we can start making finished goods yeah. and can, you know, start working with designers to make things, you know. But I feel like we will always have a component of this company that is for the makers, right. you know, because otherwise, there would not be any U.S. cashmere, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Slow growth is definitely part of our, our model, you know, bringing on one farm at a time and really knowing our farmers very, very well and supporting them, mentoring them, helping them with genetics, livestock. So, um, so yeah, so it's really all-encompassing because we are at heart farmers, because that's how we started. Um, we really, we stay true to really working closely with our farms and their yeah, we've known them for a long time, some of them, and some of them we're meeting, and it's yeah, just been yeah. great, great they, experience. So the more, you know, we are out there, the more they're like, oh, okay. And it's so tragic, but literally they have just bags of cashmere in their barn yeah. or in their closet for 20 years. They didn't know what, but they love raising the animals, yeah. you know, and... And the, ca the cashmere is going to come off whether you're doing something with it or not. Like the yep, animals shed it on your fence. I have the most expensive cashmere line fences in. 
the country. Yeah. <laughs> They're all cashmere wrapped. Because <laughs> if I don't comb it off, they'll rub it off. They're like, right. it's summer. <laughs> We're done. Amazing. Sun's out. <laughs> Sends out goats out. Oh, that's right. <laughs> they will. Well, it was lovely to meet yes, you. Yes, thank you so much. Where can everybody find you and support you and what you're doing? Um, our website is cleancashmere.farm. Um, we're on Instagram. On Instagram. We're on Facebook. Facebook um, yeah. yeah, and then we've been here at Rhinebeck. We've been so lucky to be in the Cashmere Goat Association booth. Mm -hmm. And this year we did India Untangled the first time, and that was a great experience. So this is a really high high value weekend for us as far as a company and just the energy and the and the exposure we get. Mm -hmm. um, I do some uh, fiber shows in Oklahoma and she does some in New York. Yeah, I'm located you know, in New York. Yeah, so awesome. we're looking at things that are close to where we are too, so yeah. Great. Well, it's lovely to meet you. Well, thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank thank you. you. We'll follow along as well. All right. After an inspiring conversation with Heidi and Christine, the end of the day and of this festival was capped off with the time spent with some of my dearest friends made through this fiber community. While the day before was magical, this day was peak Rhinebeck. My hope of reconnection with the fiber arts, the industry, and our community was achieved beyond my expectations and as you will see here in a minute brought me to tears of joy. what these events are all about. This right here. Right here, right here, right here. <laughs> That's a wrap on this year's New York Sheep and Wool Festival. It was absolutely magical. I'm so glad that we ended up coming today. I'm gonna go cry in the car now. <laughs> it was so good to see Paige and to reconnect with my soul friends that I have made through knitting. It's bubbling up. So I will debrief later and show you all my haul, but let's hit the road. Good morning. It is Monday, October 23rd, and that means that the weekend is officially over. <laughs> we got home safe and sound yesterday and just completely crashed, and I am blissfully tired and not exhausted, but blissfully tired. I did rest really well, got a good night's sleep, but oh my goodness, I have so much to share with you all. It was so good to meet so many of you, to see so many of my knitting friends and soul friends and the connection and the reconnection and the community, the sense of community was just what I was hoping for by traveling out here this year. So I feel so just ecstatic with how the weekend went. Not to say that there weren't challenges and I definitely want to share some of those as well, what I haven't shared already. But overall, the tone of the weekend and the experience was a beautiful one. It far exceeded expectations, to be honest. I have so much to tell you and I have a lot of tips and tricks should you be wanting to attend some of these festivals in the future that I think the best way to do so and of course my haul as well I got some more beautiful things 
I think the best way is for me to meet you back in California on the other coast <laughs> and which will be just a few seconds for you but I think that way I can collect my thoughts and we can have a nice long debrief chat about this weekend so I will see you all on the other side Welcome back to California. It has been one week since I left New York Sheep and Wool. It is now Sunday, October 29th. And I will pause here just to say a quick note that apologies for any music and crowd noise that you might hear. As you can tell by my sweater, it is only a couple of days away now from Halloween and my neighborhood is celebrating. It is hopping quite literally. There are bouncy castles across the street and there's a big like fair with lots of families and children happening. But I wanted to make sure I sat down and had a nice summary and chat. I have some tips and tricks as promised about uh, hopefully that will help you if you want to attend any of these events in the future or if you usually attend maybe there's something helpful in there as well. And then of course my haul for for New York Sheep and Wool, I wanted to make sure to share what I purchased at the festival. So let's get started with some tips and tricks. The first tip might be a little Captain Obvious, but it's something that I didn't do the first time I attended Rhinebeck, and that is to ensure that you leave a day in between your arrival date and the first day that you attend a festival. And that's if you are traveling from a great distance like I did from across the continent, or if, if you are coming from abroad, these festivals in particular are highly attended. There are gonna be large crowds, um, even without even with crowd management in proper place um, so you want to make sure that you are centered that you're grounded so that you can really take in the full spirit of these events you know they're taking place outside um, it's usually not raining although these days we got to prepare for any kind of weather which is another tip as well I'll just slide that one in there. Um, but usually it's meant to be outside to really rejoice in cooler weather finally arriving, all of the autumn colors to sit on lawns and knitting with friends. And if you're feeling frazzled after traveling, you can't really get the full effect of your money's worth of making the big trip over. So that is my first tip. The next is that if you are the type of shopper that is coming for the merch, that is coming for the special colorways, that is coming for the special collaborations, make sure to get a VIP pass or an early access pass ticket or the very first timed entry ticket if it's a timed event such as Indie Untangled. I didn't uh, know that I was gonna be attending until September, the month before. So I was very lucky to get the second slot for Indian Tangled, which was a timed event uh, for 11.30. The first one I believe was at maybe nine o'clock if I remember correctly offhand. And I think it makes a big difference if you're really coming for that purpose of wanting to get the special colorway and all of that stuff because they'll be sold out a lot of the times, especially at New York Sheep and Wool in particular, which isn't a timed entry event, um, but a lot of people line up um, right when they open so that they can make a beeline to Miss Babs, you know, booth or something similar to that, or to get that sweater quantity, you know, which I missed out on um, for sure. But if I had that in mind, if that was my goal, I think definitely plan accordingly. The next tip is to get your accommodations booked and reserved now, like now this week for next year. It books up so quickly. And definitely I recommend try, if you can, to get one in the Rhinebeck area proper because there can sometimes be a lot of traffic. There wasn't too much this year, maybe just because of the timing and I went with a veteran attendee of a Rhinebeck as well. 
but in the past I've been stuck in traffic when I went in 2017 uh, because I stayed in Kingston across uh, the river from Rhinebeck where a lot of other Airbnb and accommodations are as well. Some people stay in Sagrides, which is about half an hour away or so. Um, but if you can book wherever it is, book it now as soon as you can because it'll be in high demand because people do come far and wide for New York Sheep and Wool in particular. Well, that's the main event especially and I stayed I have a recommendation a, a non recommendation for you which is that I stayed because it was one of the last things available at the best Western in Kingston which I had actually been to before Indian Entangled was there in 2017 and it still was a popular place for a lot of people to stay there were still a lot of people staying there this time they used dynamic pricing um, which means that it was very expensive but I shared the hotel room so definitely share with your friends if you're able to but it was not, um, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't good. They are in sore need of a remodeling. It needs to be updated. And I think if it were a little bit nicer, then the price would have felt a little bit better. But I would much prefer what I am on the hunt for is a nice cozy cottage cabin like kind of thing in the Rhinebeck area proper so that I can really make it a retreat this year rather than just a trip so definitely book now the next tip is food if you have any type of allergy definitely bring your own food I have several food allergies so I brought snacks I brought meals I brought my own water I brought I think if it hadn't been raining and I was juggling a an umbrella and all kinds of stuff I probably would have snuck in a mug of tea in there as well but I just never find allergy friendly foods at these types of festivals because they're fair food and there are food trucks like Indian Tangled had some food trucks so there might have been something there that I could have had I can't remember honestly I didn't even bother looking into it because I just assume there's nothing I can eat but uh, if they had listed their food trucks which would be wonderful if festivals made sure to do that then you can look ahead of time at the menus and see if there's something that you can have there for a meal or even a snack that you can sit uh, with your friends and enjoy but if you're able to definitely bring snacks and food um, it's just your typical kind of festival kind of uh, you know funnel cakes and fried foods and there's definitely some wonderful apple cider donuts and I'm always jealous that everybody is having <laughs> but if you're able to if you're staying in an Airbnb, Airbnb or somebody's home make your own apple cider donuts bring them along with you you can totally do that the last two tips are really more of a commentary if you will about wool festivals in general where I would like to see them going and then I have some further thoughts on wool and folk so to start with festivals in general where I would like them to go I think this is something that I touched upon at stitches West this past year which is now no longer in business stitches um, but something that I observed that I want out of these festivals is places to commune to be with knitters that's something that Indian Tangle did really well I think that's something that New York Sheep um, New York Sheep and Wool Festival or oh, Rhinebeck I'm just gonna call it Rhinebeck it does really really well even with the rain I think maybe even this year I'd be interested to see um, if the organizers start to create more spaces considering that we're in global warming and we the weather is just going to be unpredictable no matter what so so if they can have more spaces where people can congregate to knit and be together I think that would be wonderful I think if you are if these festivals and the organizers are coming from a place of truly wanting to sell and have it come from a commerce kind of focus it's not going to last it's not going to be sustainable I think if you're coming from a place of community if you're coming from a place of advocacy for the farmers for the industry for the folks like clean cashmere who i met um i it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to be something like lamb town or new york sheep and wool festival 
and have the sheep there at the festival necessarily but if you're coming from that place from that spirit i think these festivals will be that much more enjoyable and successful in the long run and i want to see more of them which i think they're starting to become more popular i'm already seeing in many of your comments for part one for the first of this series that you want to seek out festivals local to you and i so encourage that I have Lambtown here. I'm going up to Sacred Sheep, which is still on the West Coast, which will be in Portland, Oregon. And I'm really excited to see more of these come about. I think it's wonderful to attend such a large event like Rhinebeck and the auxiliary events that happen around it. I have a lot of my friends are on the East Coast, so I think it's something that I'm going to always aim to attend no matter what but I am very excited to see more and more smaller local festivals crop up, not just here in America, but abroad. I know my friend Grace, Grace Zimbabwe, um, travels yarns. She is hosting an event right now in Ireland as I am sitting down to chat with you all. And I, it's wonderful to see these popping up more and more. So definitely if we demand it and want it, they will be built and we will come. And finally, some ideas, tips, if you will, and really some commentary about woolen folk. Um, I included my immediate observations in part one, if you haven't watched that already, but obviously a lot has come out the last week if you've been keeping tabs uh, from the experiences of the vendors and also attendees alike, like myself. Um, some really horrible, disheartening stories have come about and, a good thing that's happened is unfortunate in this unfortunate circumstance is that we as a fiber community have come together to support everyone and to really start defining some expectations for these festivals going forward which i think was really needed um, in terms of the vendors we have been supporting them because many of them lost so much revenue with either being put into a small corner and not being accessible as i had said um, after I had left the event, I left because I couldn't physically get to the majority of the booths because of the lack of crowd management. And then, of course, if you have ADA needs, if you needed, if you need uh, accessibility to get anywhere, you cannot have attended this event, as I had said, which is horrible, and there is no excuse for that, um, especially for such a popular event as this, and that was advertising it as accessible. Um, and regardless of the event itself, the venue needs to get with it as well, <laughs> is what I'm saying. So a tip and an idea there is that if you're going to be attending an event um, like this, if you don't already, definitely make sure that there is a map, that there is a clear exit strategy in the buildings that are being used for the event, that there are accessible restrooms, all of that stuff. Um, and if it's not, it needs, the alarms need to be raised because that in this day and age, that's not okay, honestly. It made me, I don't get angry often on this channel, but I was really angry the more I thought about it because I have family members that need accessibility. I have a mother who is on a walker or a wheelchair half of the time, and it breaks my heart to think that she would not have been able to attend this event with me, especially if we had traveled all the way from California. So enough said there. In terms of the vendors and my fellow business owners in this fiber industry, there have been some really harrowing and good talks coming out of this about what our rights are as businesses, about how to set expectations, how to define what some red flags are and when to break and get out of contracts if certain needs and expectations aren't met. So that is a good thing that's starting to come about, but it's very sad that it took this to really kind of get the conversation going again or in full force, um, but I'm glad that it is happening and that I can be in some part hopefully helping out with it in some way. Um, I have a little bit of tiny bit of uh, event organization and experience in my past life in the nonprofit arts world doing silent auctions and galas and stuff like that. So, um, so it's been really interesting and good to see. But I think in terms of a tip 
for if you are attending these kind of festivals, definitely keep an eye out for accessibility, for clear parking plans, um, all of that jazz. I know a lot of that will be kept in obvious and a lot of people were already raising alarm bells and making complaints, but I think the more that we as a group can do that going forward, the better. And finally, as I said, we're going to end on a high note with a little bit more haul and some parting thoughts about this truly amazing trip. So at the New York Sheep and Wool Festival, I really was just soaking in my main, as I said, my main goal was to connect with folks new and old, um, new and old friends, and that was very much achieved. But you know, a girl likes some fiber goods as well. <laughs> so the first on the Saturday, the first booth that really caught my eye was Felted Sky. And I met the owners, Denise went haywire in there as well, just totally creatively energized. We loved how their booth was set up, we loved um, their spirit and their intention with what they were creating. They have really wonderful curated kits of all different kinds, either on embroidery hoops, which you will have seen, or these cute little toys and kind of tchotchkes, if you will. And they're really passionate about educating people about this craft in particular. Um, they were willing to kind of, you know, tell you how to do certain things, to test it out, to test out the felting. And then also they said that with all of their kits, they have um, very thorough tutorials, which is what sold me because I am a visual learner and I like me a video tutorial. So I wanted everything in there, <laughs> but I went with these two to start. Um, I went because I'm still on a Arizona cactus kick since we took a family trip there this past April and I fell back in love with the desert. I was born there. I didn't live there very long. I'm basically a California gal, but I saw these cuties. They had examples, you know, in their booth as well. I'm like, oh my goodness, look at this. So it is three little cactus. These are all felted and these are like little wooden vases or pots, if you will. And it all comes in this kit. I bent this in my suitcase and I had one other, I only had one damaged, you know, good on my way back from <laughs> New York. Um, but inside I have opened this so I can show you. And when I start to do this on the weekly vlogs, um, I definitely will be showing the process and the progress and the finished product as I make them. I'm hoping to kind of get started with these maybe in December. I think it'll be a nice, like slow, you know, taking some time off after the rush of the holidays kind of craft to do. Um, but inside here's what you get here get all of the like little wool and you get the like little pots and everything. I'll show it all in detail whenever I start this project for sure, but I'll just quickly here like the felting needles you get. Let me see if it's open already and I can kind of show you. You can kind of see there. Ooh, ooh a dagger. <laughs> And they show you it's all like color coded. It's just, oh, uh, it's so well organized and put together. So you can kind of see that there. So that's just an example, a quick and dirty example. There's also, you get your succulents. I guess it's like succulents, not ne necessarily cactus, but it definitely, it's like quasi cacti-ish. But you get, oh, like, so what is it? Ne ne uh, needle felting is the art of poking fluffy sheep's wool with a special type of barbed needle. I mean, it's, I love the educational part of it as well because I'm a sucker for learning new things. The next kit that I got, um, the second and last kit that I got from Felted Sky this time <laughs> is a Christmas gnome. So I definitely will be making this for Christmas, I think. Uh, so cute. The little bell is what sold me and I saw the sample in there. I don't think it's open. I don't know if I want to, let's see, we'll just open it together. But yeah, here's the instructions, a similar little needle case, if you will, all of the stuff that you need, a little bell. And I think this one has a mat in it, filtered. 
Oh yeah, here it goes. There's a little mat in here and they sold these and he said I could use that for the cactus too. So that's what you use to put your felting on top and then stab away. <laughs> this would be very cathartic. So that is the first purchase that I made there. Then I did get some yarn. I will say that later in the day on Saturday, I went to the Green Mountain Spinnery booth and I found a sweater that I fell in love with, a sample. I love looking at samples, which you will have seen a lot of video of throughout the vlog. Um, and I think it's called the Rianne sweater. I'll leave a link down to it down below as well as everything that I'm mentioning here. Um, and I was, I was ready to buy a sweater quantity, but they only had, I think, two skeins in the colorway that I wanted. Um, so that's something I'm gonna keep an eye out. I think I really would love to use their wool. It's, they've been on my list for years now. Um, so I'm gonna keep an eye out for that. I don't know if they're gonna be at Sacred Sheep, but I'm gonna keep, keep an eye out. I'll let you know, I'll be taking you along, so we'll look and see. But the other yarn that really caught my heart and to my eye was by a new to me business, but I had heard of, well, I had heard of them, but I hadn't seen their yarn in person yet. And it's Into the World. And I loved this yarn. Oh my goodness. Oh, the light is hitting it so right. Look at this. I saw a sample of it knit up in a sock and I fell in love i'm very much into either this kind of dark academia plies and hellhounds you know has a lot of this kind of colorway kind of vibe or hot pink <laughs> which i'm on the hunt for in sacred sheep as well uh, my friend kemper of junk yarn is going to be there so i'm going to be hitting up your booth kemper if you're watching um so i got this and this is called hijinks and it's a pakoku sock base which is a uh, four ply superwash merino, um, 75 superwash merino, 25% nylon, and it's 100 grams, 460 yards. And I, this will probably be a pair of socks or something, but add it to my stash. And then that was it for the fiber related things that I got. Then I got some knitting adjacent kind of stuff and i got some tea i need tea just like i need yarn in my life <laughs> i have a stash that is rivaling my yarn stash and this was in the food booth or the food barn which it is i think i don't know what the official name of the barn was or the area but it's also where the contest voting was and workshops and whatnot um and i came upon this booth and fell in love with this tea so i got a variety of the non-caffeine um it is a glow herbal tea hibiscus um organic roman provence ruibos mint chocolate and orange bourbon which sounds so good and i loved their little presentation they all came in these little glass vials. So, oh, I can't wait to try these out. I definitely wanna try the glow and keep that immunity going up because it has some turmeric in it. And the orange bourbon sounds really, really good. I don't drink, but, and so hopefully it doesn't have like a strong bourbon flavor to it, but it sounds really, really good. I don't even, it doesn't even have it. It has apple pieces, hibiscus, rose hips, orange pieces, sunflower, and safflower petals. So it should be good to go. So I got that. And then the last thing that I got that I am starting to also have a stash of wooden spoons. I have really transitioned to just wooden spoons. I love cooking. I don't show it nearly enough here on this channel and I wanna rectify that soon. But I love myself a good spoon and I'd heard of these or a similar company before and I fell in love. So I got this spatula, look how beautiful. This is all by Basil's or Basil's Chester P. 
And I got this one, which is like a really nice, like sharp kind of egg, make your eggs in the morning because the one that I use doesn't have this sharp of a edge to it. So it's a little bit harder to like, you know, I like to chop up my sausage and then scramble my eggs and stuff. So I think that'll be a great like sauteer size. They had, I mean, every size and type that you could think of. And then I loved this one. This is called, I don't know if it shows, a sorry a pot sitter spoon this spoon will sit on your pot edge between stirs so you put it this little slit like on your dutch oven or pot and then it just kind of sits there it's so oh i love it like to make like tomato sauce or i think i you know i love making wassail um in the dutch oven and having it simmer, my mouth is watering thinking about it, and have it simmer and get all of those spices. I'm definitely already in the holiday mood, even though we're still a couple of days away from Halloween, but love this for my collection, especially this one. I think this is so classic and cool. And then the next one was the casualty <laughs> that I have to do some Gorilla Glue on, which I just borrowed from my mom. And that was something I did not need, but charmed me. And that is a brownie server. <laughs> it's to scoop out your brownies. I was like, yeah, I want that in my life. They weren't too, they, I can't remember the prices, but they were not um, too expensive. They were well-priced and really high quality. So it broke in two like that. So I just need to add some Gorilla Glue because it won't be near where the food's going to be. So I think it should be okay. And then you can just, you know, take care of it with hand wash it, of course. And you can use a beeswax and kind of mineral um, oil kind of salve, if you will, to cure it, um, which I can get at like a farmer's market or I can create my own. Um, but yeah, so that was my haul. The yarn fumes are running high again, and this is definitely a wonderful high note to end this travel vlog series on. I hope that you enjoyed coming along with me to New York. I'm very much hoping to go again next year, and I'm looking forward to heading up to Portland in just a few days as I'm sitting down to chat with you. If you haven't already, definitely subscribe and join us each week for the weekly vlogs. I'll be back this coming Sunday with progress made on my current whips, maybe starting one of these new ones, who knows, as well as a look at what I am making for my shop. We are in full holiday mode. Christmas, winter is here it has been very cold as well so much to share there as well you can find all the places where you can connect with me down in the show notes and i hope to see you all again very soon hopefully on sunday bye